oral history video project, an interview with Edward Poe, Titusville, Florida, March 30th, 1995. Interviewer Nancy Asecco, cameraman Robert Gilbert, camera Sony DXCM7, recorder Sony BVW35. Copyright Brevard County Historical Commission, 1995. Okay, the first thing we'd like to do is have you tell us your name and when and where you were born. My name is Edward Poe. I was born in Albany, New York, August 26, 1918. And when did you come to Brevard County? Well, my family, mother and father, decided to come down here shortly after the armistice of World War I. And uh, we took a nice steamship ride down on Clyde Mowry from New York to Jacksonville and arrived just before Christmas of 1918. Uh, I don't remember much about the voyage, but they tell me I was the only one to not get seasick. It was quite rough, and they just opened the bottom bureau drawer and put me in it. So I came through in very fine fashion. So all your growing up years were here. That's correct. In this mm -hmm. area. What was it like when you were a kid? Well, fighting mosquitoes was a big part of the time. And of course, we didn't have uh, playgrounds and such, so we had to really uh, uh, improvise and develop our own things. Uh, baseball in the street was a very popular game. You had to watch for cars, though, but uh, at that time, they traveled rather slowly, so uh, it was not a real hazard. But to have playgrounds as we have now was, no, was just non-existing at that time. Yeah. Where did your family settle? We settled right here in Titusville. My mother had a sister and her husband who came down here in about 1912 from Hornell, New York. And they were in the automobile business, I guess one of the first agencies here. And for, I have no idea why my mother and father came because uh, this was completely new to them. Uh, my mother was a school teacher. My father was a bookkeeper and a salesman. And to come down to Titusville in a very frontier town was well, I just can't imagine them doing it. I can't understand why, but they did it. Mm -hmm. What kind of house did they have when they came? Well, the houses were very primitive. They were small. Uh, they probably built one or two new houses a year in this town. And when they did, it was a groundbreaking ceremony. So they were just really cracker-style houses and uh, uh, no heating to speak of. And, of course, no uh, 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 acoustical materials and so forth. You usually had a great big fireplace and you uh, dressed in front of that fireplace in the morning and tried to stay warm. Mm -hmm. It was just very, very primitive. I always remember being cold. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just the way it was at those times. Now, I would imagine that some people would think it'd be just too, too hot here. Well, you sort of get used to it, I'm sure. We got acclimated. Uh, it was hot. Uh, and the houses were built with uh, what they considered cross ventilation, and you just had to have it in order to exist. And here on the, on the East Coast, we were fortunate. We usually had a southeast prevailing breeze in the summertime, and that's what saved us. But the mosquitoes were the real, the biggest problem, as I can remember as a kid, in the cold in the wintertime. We just were not suited for it and not equipped to handle it. Probably didn't have heavy winter clothes. No, and all mine were hand-me-downs. I was a little bit small for my age, and I had a cousin who was a little bit older and bigger, so I got all his clothes. So uh, if he had warm clothes, I had warm clothes. <laughs> but that's, that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. Did you have brothers and sisters? I had two sisters who were born a little later in life. Uh, they're about seven and eight years younger than I am, and uh, they were born uh, here in Orlando. And uh, we were living in Orlando at that time for just a short period of time. Mm -hmm. The big city. Yes, big city. Compared to Titusville. Town wasn't very big. No, it sure wasn't. Uh, I don't know how many people. There couldn't have been more than a, a thousand people here when we came here. Uh, US-1 was a gravel road, oyster shell. And we lived right uh, on the edge of the, of the road. And uh, some of my air recollections is the cattle drive that used to come every summer right down Garden Street, which is old US-1. 
And in the summertime, they would come and drive them across the wooden bridge over to what we call Merritt Island, where they'd uh, probably burn the grass so they had fresh grass coming along. And uh, uh, that's a very uh, mm -hmm. memorable time. They, um, our porch was sort of low to the ground, and uh, these cattle had great big menacing horns. And they would come in and stick their neck about two or three feet over on that porch and shake their head, try to get the flies off. Well, that scared a young fellow like me, who was about five or six at the time. That would be memorable. <laughs> sure was. I guess they stopped doing that after a while. Yes, they did. Uh, they stopped them from doing it. But that was a sort of an, a summer event each year for a number of years. And I think they did it several other towns also. And it's quite a dry, uh, job to drive cattle across a wooden bridge. I wouldn't you, think it would be You've got to do a lot of encouraging. And I can remember the whip cracking at that time. It was a round pops. Yeah. Were there rails on the bridge? Uh, yes, there was rails on the bridge. So they didn't fall in? No, no problem there. Yeah. An interesting time of my life, just to deviate a bit, before the bridge was built, or while it was being built, uh, my father and mother had decided that they were going to take up a homestead. And at that time, the government says, well, if you'll go over and prove up 10 acres, and put it in production, uh, we'll give you 160 acres. So my mother was a school teacher. I don't know what my father was doing, but he decided to go over and clear up 10 acres of grubbing out the palmettos. The, the palmetto grows right on top of the ground with about a thousand roots. And you grubbed it out with a great big instrument called a grubbing hoe. So uh, the way we get there was uh, we'd walk partway on the bridge and being a small fellow looking down about 10 or 15 feet in the water walking on these pylons then we'd get into a fish launch and go the rest of the way over across the river then we'd get in the horse and wagon and go about five miles to the little town of Wilson which had a post office there and a little grocery store then you trudged about three or four miles right through the swamp to your to your place of uh, where you were clearing we had just a one-room shack, probably a 10 by 20, uh, with a little porch on the front, but it was very, very primitive. And my mother and I would go over in the summertime, I was about five then, to, to, to help and, and, and be company to him. So it was quite, a, quite another memorable page in my life. That was over on the island, Merritt Island? Yes, it's on Merritt Island. It's on the way over to the ocean here, and it's about uh, 11 miles across the, the peninsula here. And it's just north of now where they shoot the missiles from. Uh -huh. And there were a number of other homesteaders over there, probably 20 or 30 families over there who were homesteading at the same time and clearing up this land, because there was just nothing much to do here. Oh. Well, that was, that was hard work. Very, very hard. I, again, why a, a man who was a bookkeeper and a salesman would undertake something like that, I have no idea. Did he get the 10 acres? Yes, we got the, we proved it up. We planted potatoes and uh, got deed to the 160 acres and uh, we kept it up until the time the government came along and said, we sort of need this now and we'd like to take it from you. So, yeah. of course, they paid us for it. Hardly pay for the effort of pulling no. out those. Did you work with the grub hoe too? Or no, you I did, them? and and you had to, when, once you grub these roots out, you stacked them up in a big pile, pyramid, and you'd let them dry. When they were dry, then you would burn them. So uh, we did that. He did that for about two summers, mm -hmm. and uh, then of course there wasn't much to do here at that time. It was very very sparse uh, business, and mm -hmm. citrus and fishing was the only thing here. Yeah, we went, then went up in the north end of the county and developed a citrus grove. Uh, again, about a 20 acres, which you have to cut down the palmettos, big palmetto trees, and clear all by hand. It was all done by hand. And uh, we did that for another summer. So that's my very early days in the agri <laughs> agriculture enterprise. <laughs> Well, you must have run into some uh, snakes and varmints. Uh, we had a very interesting encounter with a, about a 12-foot rattlesnake one day. At the, my mother and I was walking doing the, through the clearing, and the rattlesnake went right in front of us. And, of course, it headed right for the uh, pile of scrub uh, palmettos, and it took quite a little bit of uh, work to find to kill that snake. But it had 14 buttons on it. 
So it was a good, 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 good sized rattlesnake. You never got bit? No, stayed away from them. And up in the north end of the hammock, the thing was interesting up there, they had drainage ditches. And when the ditches were dry, the hogs, the uh, wild hog, hogs would run up and down those drainage ditches. You could hear them coming about uh, 100 miles, 100 yards away because they rustled the palmettos. So of course, we immediately, the kids, we got out of that ditch. <laughs> they came through like a freight train. They were mean. Very mean, very vicious, big ones, wild. Nothing to do. Big, big tusk on them. Get out of the way. That's right. <laughs> Wouldn't want to tangle with them. Well, did you ever go hunting? We used to hunt, I used to hunt before the war, uh, duck hunting here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had very good duck hunting over on the uh, east shore of the river in uh, Banana Creek, which goes up to the Missile Now and Moores Creek. And uh, we were in the grocery business at that time, and uh, I had worked from about 6 o'clock in the morning to about 11 or 12 at night, and uh, then we'd get in a canoe and paddle over there and hunt all day and then paddle back. Needless to say, I was a little bit <laughs> pooped when I came home. But you brought some ducks with you. Yes. Honey was very good, very fine. Yeah. You were a little guy when you were going over there with your dad. Yes, I was sort of small for my age. And uh, I remember one day we went across uh, the river to, and, we, and it started to rain. We got to the other side. Uh, my mother covered me up with a Sears and Roebuck catalog she'd just received. So we went to this Wilson store, and this gentleman had five nice-looking daughters. And uh, I was, so, of course, soaking wet, and uh, my mother started to change me right out there in the middle of the floor, and I said, not here. <laughs> so I said, take me by <laughs> behind the mail bag, which she did to change me. But once we'd get to Wilson store, and then you had to walk right through the scrub uh, marsh, and I being small and the mosquitoes being fierce, they put me in what's called a gunny sack or a croaker sack, which you can breathe through, but they just uh, put me in there and tied the top and put, me, and put it over the shoulder, and that's how I rode to the, to the camp. Okay. What else would you do to deal with the mosquitoes? Another interesting thing is we would make switches out of palmettos, and you would uh, shred them down, and they'd be about three feet long, and you left about a foot for the handle, and you kept that switch moving constantly right around your shoulders, uh, everyone else uh, had a great big hat on and you put netting down over that. You wore boots and you wore long sleeve shirts and sometimes gloves on your hand. Because they, they would just sing around your head and just buzz and they were just, well they were just miserable. Were they so many you could, you could see them? Oh yes, they just swarmed, they swarmed. And uh, another thing you had to do, about five o'clock in the afternoon, you had to paint the screens with kerosene because what we call is a really sand fly, some people call them a noceum. They would come out of the sand. And the last thing you did before you turned the lamp out at night was get a newspaper and kill mosquitoes in the room. If it didn't, they would just eat you up all night long. So it was, a, it was an evening procedure that you had to do. Did you have a net over the area where you slept? Or? We did sometimes, yes. You could uh, put netting over your bed. And uh, yes, you had to do that to get any sleep at all. Oh. Uh, and you put sometimes put additional netting on the screens, but uh, it, the wind would blow it and it would tear and so forth. So it was sort of hard to keep in place, but uh, it was just a very artist time in my young life. <laughs> I, c I can imagine that would just be awful. Um, what was the transportation like? Well, very few cars. Uh, later on, my father uh, bought a couple trucks, and we were in the what we called the transfer business, the hauling business. The roads still were gravel at that time, and uh, we would uh, truck sand, coquina rock, and also haul fish. We had quite a fishing industry here, and right at the foot of uh, Main Street, there was a dock going about 1,200 feet out into the water, into the river. And on each side, there was probably three or four fish houses. And the uh, fishermen would bring their fish a catch from the night into those places and wash them and pack them. You'd pack them in barrels, wooden barrels, which were made here in Titusville, and you packed them in ice. And then uh, we would come on our this Model T flatbed truck and 
pick up these many barrels of fish and take them over to the railroad station where they had built a, a, a regular platform there where you could put the fish inside and then the, truck, the trains came through that night, they loaded it on the trains. But uh, this, there was nothing to catch uh, uh, for us to haul 40, 50 barrels of fish over there every day. You're kidding. And Those are went, big barrels. How big would they be? They're, they're about 100 pound barrels and uh, they stand about three, three and a half feet high. And you pack them with a layer of fish, a layer of ice and another layer of fish and then you put a head in it. The barrels were made right here in, in uh, Titusville, right behind the old post office. A family by the name of Scobie, George Scobie Jr., had a barrel factory there. Plus, he had a, f a very good sized fish house out on the pier and sold a lot of the netting and various supplies to the various fishermen. Mm -hmm. But there were probably five or six, seven fish houses along this pier, and it was just a uh, old wooden dock with no rails on it at all. And it sort of scared me as a young fellow going out there to pick up these barrels of fish because you had very little turning around room and driving a Model T truck is not the easiest thing to do. So that was my first driving experience. Later on, I, I could handle it all right, but in the beginning, I was, it was quite scary. Where would they ship the fish off to? And most of them went to New York, and this is our millet. Uh, that, was the, that was the mainstay. They caught some trout, of course, but uh, millet was the biggie. Mm -hmm. And you had uh, the launches would go out every afternoon about 4 o'clock with about three of the skiffs behind it. And they'd put out the nets during the night and uh, then come in about 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning, process the fish, and uh, 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon was ready for us to pick up to take to the freight station. That's a lot of fish. That's right. Shipped a lot of them. And that stayed uh, very good until about 35. And then uh, many of our fishing families sort of moved down to Sebastian. They have an inlet down there, and I don't think ours were fished out, but uh, there was just more prevalent down there. Mm -hmm. And they could catch different species of fish. Mm -hmm. Also, they could go outside and fish. Mm -hmm. So I would say 90% of our fishing families moved out at that, about that time. Hmm. Um, there were other boats that were on the water, though. Oh, yes, you had some. You had a few, um, but not many. Our boat basin was constructed by WPA in 1935. Um, going back a little bit, in about 1925, a firm came up here from Miami and started to dredge out in the river and put up a bulkhead line. And they pumped in about three different spoil islands, but they weren't contiguous. They were sort of separated. And about that time, the Florida land boom, as we know it, collapsed. And mysteriously, this one night about midnight, the dredge burned and sank. And we used that for a very fine fishing spot for many, many years, right off what's our little bulkhead line here now. So you'd go fishing for fun? I never have fished much. No. I, I, I don't know why, but I just, maybe I didn't catch many, so I just <laughs> wasn't too encouraged. Mm -hmm. But uh, the boat basin was a result of these little spoil islands. And during the WPA, they came in with the funds and a local man. To, and again, we hauled some of the coquina rock there, which lines the exterior outline of the basin. And that's when it was d dug. Hmm. And also at that time, they built the overhead pass. So they excavated for the overhead pass across the railroad track for US-1. Mm -hmm. So that made a deep hole out there. And thus came the yacht basin. We had a few boats here, but not, not many. Mm. The railroad was used a lot for... Yes, the railroad was the main thing. And uh, Florida East Coast was uh, ran passenger trains as well as freight. And you had them going through here all the time of the day and, and in the night. Uh, you, you were well aware of the trains going through here at night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure were. Uh, roads slowly got better. And uh, uh, the, the US-1 was paved after a bit, of course. And uh, so, but tr even trucking was, it was just beginning in about in the late 30s, the mm -hmm. hauling citrus and so forth. So mm -hmm. trucking was just sort of beginning as I recall. Mm -hmm. Well, the roads were just kind of ruts, weren't they? Well, they were originally, although they were very, the oyster shell makes a pretty good base and that's what they were, a little dusty, but they were mm -hmm. sort of hard and you do have to scrape them uh, to keep those little ripples out of them. Mm -hmm. But, um, and that's what we had over the beach for many, many years to 
I think after World War II before we got the uh, road paved over to the ocean. Yeah. It was a, it was quite an uh, experience to get on that rutted road. And you had to keep it from rattling your teeth out. You had to get up about 40, 50 miles an hour to stay on top of the ripples. <laughs> Were there enough ruts that a car could come towards you and pass you, or did you have to? Yeah, you slowed down, and that's when your teeth really <laughs> jarred. Because if you ever lost control, it was sort of like being on uh, a wet pavement. Uh, you didn't have control of your car at 40, 50 miles an hour, because you were b bouncing along just on the top of these ripples, as I call them ripples. Yeah. But. Uh, that's like the, I've heard the word washboard. Is that yes, the same that's thing? a washboard, right. You've probably experienced those shaking your teeth on a washboard. That's what this was. And it was about 25 miles over to the beach we went to at DeSoto Beach, which is where the missiles fired from now. So that was a very hazardous ride. Mm -hmm. Why would you go over to the beach? Well, it was a very fine bathing beach. Uh, DeSoto has, was an excellent beach, big, flat beach. And uh, there were several houses over there. Some people from Orlando had built a couple houses. There was a casino over there, a good-sized casino. So that was where we went for our recreation. Uh -huh. We did not have a swimming pool here at all. And the closest one was down in Rockledge, which we would take maybe once a month and go to. Uh, and, or either that or go to the ocean. Uh -huh. So, uh, But DeSoto Beach was just a fine bathing beach, and that's where we went. I've heard other folks refer to casinos. What do you mean by a casino? Well, it was a picnic area. It was covered. You had your bathhouses there and so forth and showers. And you could go and have a big picnic there and so forth. You get in out of the sun and mosquitoes. Uh, Did they sell food there too? Yes, they have. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So it was quite active there for quite a few years. Uh, sounds like a lot of fun. It was. You're saying there, there was a golf course over here? We had a golf course called uh, Whispering Hills, built back in the boom time again. And uh, the favorite uniform at that time was, of course, long socks and knickers. And my father was in the real estate business in about 24, 25, 26. So uh, that was the, the, the gathering spot, the social center. It was a very nice club. and. Uh, we did have some people who would come over from Orlando to visit. There could have been a little uh, gambling going on. I don't know for sure. But it was a very nice uh, spot, and it's still here. Uh, the, course, the golf course has been closed up, and the Baptist Church has bought it and uh, has classrooms there and so forth. So it's still serving uh, mm -hmm. the, the community very well. Mm. It sounds like your dad was involved in all kinds of stuff. Back there, you had to do a number of things from clearing land to planting an orange grove, trucking business. We got in the chicken raising business. We probably had a thousand chickens at one time and uh, dressed and sold the poultry to the stores here, eggs. Uh, you just had to do most anything during the Depression days to try to put uh, two nickels together. My mother still taught school and uh, my dad sort of liked real estate for some reason. and. Uh, uh, of course, when the bubble broke with the Florida land boom, why, we were left with several pieces of property. And ironically, we just sold the last one at Indian Atlantic the other day uh, for much more than we paid for it, but prices were very high then. And the land boom, you never knew you were going to pay for the piece of property because you thought you could sell it the next day for more money. So everything was done on paper. So uh, the only piece of property we have left is a piece out at South Lake that uh, we wound up with four or five that, and we struggled to pay for them too. Mm -hmm. The taxes and of course at one time nobody could pay taxes here. Yeah. That's another story in the life of Titusville and the development period. Uh, in 25 they bonded themselves quite heavily to put in sewer and paved roads. Up until then we just didn't have them in the town except the US-1. So uh, during the depression days people could not pay their taxes. Uh, we bonding company uh, uh, sort of foreclosed on the city and uh, they kept tr crying and trying and uh, uh, of course later on uh, we got more people in here and that was the only way we were able to pay these bonds off yeah. was newcomers we just had to have people but uh, we had a struggle there for about 10 years and many other Florida towns had the same thing tell me a little bit more about the boom what 
What was really going on there? Well, for some reason, the, the Florida land just got to be the hottest thing in the world. And the people would come down from, mostly from the Ohio, the Illinois area, and they'd come to Miami. And they would bus them from there up to here and meet them in Melbourne, in Atlantic. Probably 30, 40 people on a bus. And then the, I guess the, I didn't observe any of this, of course, but the real estate people came out and started to entertain these people and take them around and show them various properties. But that happened in many places in, 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 in Florida, of course, in the Miami also. But uh, the prices were phenomenal. Give me uh, an example if you can. Pardon? Can you give me an example? Yes, I would say um, probably a lot sold for thirty, forty thousand dollars. Where what time before that it probably been eight or nine, six, seven, eight, nine thousand. So they really boomed the prices up. And uh, as I say, we probably got a little more than we paid for this lot after about uh, fifty, sixty years, but not much more. And uh, so hard to determine what you did pay for it because at that time. All you did put on your deed was one dollar and other consideration. There was no stamp, so you could not, uh, I had no way of proving how, what our parents uh, had paid for this property. And it happened to be one old real estate operator in Melbourne who's now deceased, Elton Hall, and I had to get letters from him as to what approximately the value was or what our parents paid for the property when we went to sell it. So it was uh, mm -hmm. another little hassle. Boy, that's something. Well, so there was there was a big boom, and then that bust, mm -hmm. and that came with the depression. Yes, about thirty, about twenty-eight, twenty-nine, when the stock market crashed. And the, did the banks close here? Banks closed. All the banks closed, uh, and it stayed that way to about thirty-five. And uh, we got a reopening of a bank here. Uh, up to that time, you had to take your money down to Coco Barnett Bank was about the only one that stayed afloat. So you went down there once a week with your cash in hand and made a deposit. But uh, in 35, we had a gentleman that came in and, and started a local bank with local people subscribing. But up until then, it was pretty, pretty mm. pathetic. But just nobody had money and uh, very few cars, very few people had telephones. And uh, it was a very quiet little town. I understand people did a lot of bartering. They yes, you sure did. Uh, my s new second wife here, her father was a doctor here, and he had to barter for his uh, fees, of course, at, back at that time. And Saturday night was a big night. Everybody came to town on Saturday night, and uh, there were not too many parking places, so people would actually come in the morning and park their cars and walk home so they could come back at night, sit in their cars, and visit with their neighbors. And at that time, we kept our grocery stores open about 11 o'clock at night. And some people didn't do their shopping until they got out of the second movie. So it made a long day. <laughs> See, that's a different picture than you'd imagine. Yes. Uh, before I got out of high school, my parents had bought a small store, grocery store. And uh, through hard work and so forth, why we developed in a pretty good sized store, we only, we, there was about three or four competitors here, but the main one was a Piggly Wiggly across the street from us and an A&P across the street from us. So and we were on one side and the two chains on the other, and we were only about 200 feet apart. So we had quite a little battle going on. Consequently, we had to sell for credit because they sold for cash, and that's the only way we could get the business. Mm -hmm. But I guess it worked out right because you didn't make much money because all your money was on the books. And you had to work 18, about 80 hours a week. So if you had money, it worried you. You wouldn't have time to spend it. <laughs> so it balanced out. Were there dances and things on Saturday night? Yes, they, uh, they had quite a few here. Unfortunately, I was not a dancer. So I did not have, I sort of missed that fun. Mm -hmm. But uh, they had quite a few here. Uh, they had a Pythian Sisters Hall, which uh, seemed to be the, uh, the place where they held these dances. And, then we had another place down at Clark's Corner, which is State Road 50 and, in, and US 1 intersection. We had a very nice dance hall and a restaurant on the east side of the river and two service stations on the west side. And that happened to be the bus station for many, many years. So it was quite a gathering spot down there. Also later on, we had just an outdoor swimming pool or hole down there, you might call it. It was, not the, it was just a diked up area. 
That's where we, that was where we, we kids swam. Yeah. Um, what about on holidays? What about July 4th? Well, July 4th was a big time. And uh, I got involved in the JCs a little later on in life. And uh, we always uh, sponsored and put on the 4th of July parade. And, uh, but that was rather a hazardous undertaking. Uh, the last time we did it, we bought a lot of trinkets to sell. And bus pad, it just rained all that day. So we said had a financial loss as a result of that. But we did have horse races uh, out on, again, out on the uh, Sand Point area where this land had been filled in uh, uh, following 1935. They connected all these islands. We had a baseball field out there. We had semi-pro baseball here. It was quite prominent in this part of the, uh, of the area. Coco, Melbourne, New Smyrna, Orlando, Sanford, all had semi-pro baseball teams. So that was the big, uh, you might say, entertainment. And the fourth, we would have the horse races out there. These were cow ponies who came in off the marsh. <laughs> Local horses. Yes. And, and they even tried to have a couple stock car races, but that was not too successful. <laughs> Well, it's hard to imagine these cowboys coming in. Yes, they came in from the Kissimmee area and uh, between here and Orlando. Uh, there was quite a bit, quite a bit of cattle out there, and uh, around Melbourne there was a lot of cattle. So there'd be nothing for 40, 50, or 100 of them to come here for, for the fourth. Mm -hmm. And of course, we always had the horses in the parade. Mm -hmm. Last thing. The horses were the last. <laughs> the big finish. <laughs> the finale. Um, what about other, uh, did you have something at May Day that was a, a Not thing? much at May Day. We had a little bit in school at May Day, mm -hmm. as I recall, but not, it was, wasn't, a, wasn't a big day down here, no. The fourth was the big community. The fourth right? was a biggie, uh-huh, uh -huh. sure was. Well, let's talk a little bit about school. When you went to school, what, what was your school day like? Well, I guess I was a very poor student. Too. I think they added my grades together rather than average them so I could get out. Uh, I was interested in sports and many other things, and uh, I got involved in basketball while I was in school. Uh, I never, I guess I didn't notice girls. I'd gotten quite a bit older, so uh, I must have been sort of sports-minded up until I got out of high school. But uh, we started, of course, in the downtown where the city hall is now, what we call the elementary school, and then during the time we were there, about 27, they built a high school, and then they moved the last seven grades down to the high school. I guess I went down there in about the third or fourth year it was open. Mm -hmm. And it was a very nice building. Again, about all we had in the way of sports was the football. Uh, I don't think we had baseball to my last year in, in, in high school. Uh, we, just, we were just sort of strapped at those times. Did not have lights on the football field. Uh, a few years later, they lighted the field with some old uh, coal buckets they brought down here from Kentucky. We had a coach here from Kentucky, so he went up there and got a lot of coal buckets and brought them down here, and we converted those into football lights. So that was our first lighted field, it was after I got out of school. Uh, a little bit of intramural, but not much. No tennis at all. Our uh, first tennis court was built here, uh, that is a public court, in about 35, again by WPA. So up until then, we just didn't know what tennis was all about. Well, y'all were country folks. Very much so. Still a very small town, probably 2,500 to 3,000 people, uh, with citrus and uh, fishing being uh, the mainstay. We had no tourist business to speak of. Everybody went through here on the way to Miami, that's all, we, when we got to see them. You said your dad had planted a citrus grove. Did you ever? We planted it, that? and then he later sold it. Yeah. Uh, so we really need, didn't keep it too long. It's a lot of work. A lot of work, and uh, uh, he just went off into other endeavors and so forth, and uh, got involved in other real estate activities. Okay. Um, you told us about your your grocery store downtown. What other businesses do you recall that were downtown? Well, uh, right across the street from us was a, a feed store where they sold the, all the feed to the various uh, people around here. We had a couple of uh, uh, dry goods stores uh, down next to the bank. Uh, we had a very fine uh, Greek family here who ran a restaurant and a bar, Carantina's family, for, for many years. And uh, so they were all small merchants. 
we had some dry goods stores, and uh, but um, they were just small, small stores. Nothing, nothing large at all. Um, a lot of it was on credit. Uh, one Jewish gentleman had a very favorite saying. I still think about. It. He says, uh, "You don't need to pay me now. Just give me your check." which is the same as say, gee, I'll give you a slow note. Don't bank it to 30 days from now. <laughs> anyway, <it> was, <laughs> they, were, they were just very honorable people back here, and, and, uh, but, but small business people, mm -hmm. small in size. There was a theater, I guess, a movie theater. We had a theater. Yes, we had one theater in town, and later on we had a second one. It didn't last too long. But the Magnolia Theater, and, and before that we had, yes, let me uh, mention, we had a Van Croy Theater. It started about in about 23, 24. And this is when you had an organist play the music. And we lived right next door to this lady who was the organist there, and she had a rather attractive daughter too. But, uh, and they also built one in uh, Melbourne, which uh, they ran for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was the big thing here, going to Saturday afternoon matinee, mm -hmm. see Tom Mix and Tom Holt and some of those boys. But, uh, a bunch of kids go and meet yes. there. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Saturday, Saturday matinee was a biggie. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your parents pretty much just let you run loose, didn't they? Yes, yeah. Pretty much so. Uh, no curfew or anything like that. <laughs> it, was, it, it was no mis misbehaving to speak of. You never got in trouble? No, not much, no. No. <laughs> not that I can recall, <laughs> but I got caught out anyway. <laughs> Uh, uh, you're f let's see, um, what about uh, doctors? Well, we had several doctors here. Of course, uh, my second wife's husband, uh, father, was a, a, a new doctor here. And What's I had an name? interesting experience with him. I fell out of a tree when I was about five years old. It seemed I didn't like to keep my feet on the ground. And my mother warned me to come down out of that tree, you're going to fall. I said, oh, I won't fall. Well, sure enough, I fell. I fell, fell in a lot of broken bottles. Broke my arm, and the arm is sticking up about an inch this way, and the blood's coming down out of my chin, and I'm scared to death. And uh, took me to Janet McLeod's uh, father, Dr. McLeod, Bob McLeod. And he tells an innocent thing. He says, I couldn't stop him from crying. He, uh, he said, is the arm hurting you? No, the arm's not hurting me. The only reason I'm crying is I'm afraid of the spanking I'm going to get when I get home. Did you get a spanking when you Yes, got I'm sure I got one. I'm sure I got one. Mm -hmm. But that, uh, that was my earliest recollection with the doctor. We had another interesting uh, situation. When you wanted your tonsils out, uh, they had a traveling doctor come here. And they'd get about 30 40s up in the top floor of the elementary school with this big gymnasium up there. And, of course, it meant our dads had to stay with us all night while we were up there hooping and trying to get water down. But... Uh, They'd do about 25 of us at, at a time, but once a year, and they'd come through here, sort of like they do cattle, I guess, and they <laughs> removed our tonsils. So that's another experience I remember, all night long. Oh, man. <laughs> that must have been miserable. Yes. We had several other doctors here, too. Uh, Janet's father died when he was very young. We had a gentleman named Dr. Potoff and a Dr. Adams here. And Dr. Adams had a big family, so... Uh, uh, those are about the only two that were here, and they were here quite a while. Was there a dentist? Yes. We had a dentist, a Dr. Litzenberger, who had been here for many years and practiced up until just a few years back when he passed away. Did but, you ever uh, have to go see him? Yes, quite a few times, quite a few times. And my favorite trick was after I went to the dentist, I'd go to the dime store and buy uh, caramel candy. I guess I wanted to test the feelings because I'd eat that caramel candy. Sure, sure enough, none of them ever came out. <laughs> but it was not a very pleasant experience up in that dentist chair. Where was his office? Right up in, in the center of town. It was right up over where Nevin's Fruit Company had their office, right up over the Rexall Drug Store, uh -huh. which, uh, which a Dr. Spell pharmacist came here many years ago and built a Rexall Drug Store right down in town, a two-story building. And the, that seemed to be where the doctors sort of had their offices uh, uh, most of the time. That makes sense. Yeah, right close by. You go downstairs and, and get, get your get prescription your filled. Mm. Um, 
Well, let's see now, in Titusville, there, it was the county seat. Yes, it was. Uh, and of course, they had some innocent trials here back in the old days. Uh, uh, the, the courthouse being here, and this was where all the murder cases were tried, and we had several back in those days. So, uh, did uh, you ever go go watch? Oh yes, I went up there several times, mm -hmm. and it was quite interesting. We had several very fine uh, attorneys here at that time. Uh, one was called a, a, a Colonel Noah Butts, I think, from Coco, and he was quite a uh, quite a barrister. He could <laughs> he could sort of power the counter there for him. He was very interesting to watch. That would be high drama. Yes, yes. I, I've heard it said he never lost a case. Do you think that? Well, I doubt it. I never heard of him, but uh, I didn't keep up with it that closely. But he was quite a famous, well-known attorney. He usually took the murder cases, I think. Probably paid more money. <laughs> Would people then just, from town, if there was a good case, they'd go yes, up? Yes, that's right. If they were interested in it, or if they had a lot of kin folks, there was one uh, case that uh, drew a lot of attention because she had seven sons, I think, and uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, people who went to listen to that case. Uh -huh. What was it about? She had shot her husband and killed him, uh -huh. and uh, he sort of mistreated her, and I guess she'd had enough of it, so uh, she decided to end it all, but she was set free. Was she? Yeah, evidently she had very good cause. He, his reputation was not too good. She did raise seven real fine sons, just excellent citizens. Do you remember any other particular cases? No, not offhand, I don't, no. Uh -huh. That's probably the one I remember the most. What about, um, let's see, there were county commissioners and, and all kinds of county work going on. Yes, we did. We had, uh, and of course back there you didn't have uh, um, aid to children or families or something like that. So the county commissioner was the one that doled out the, the money or the help. And we had a very interesting gentleman here who was our county commissioner and uh, you know, somebody would go up and plead their case and he'd just scribble on a paper bag or a piece of paper and say, take this down to Post Grocery. <laughs> Get your groceries. And that's about what they helped him with was groceries. But it was quite common. To, and that's the way it was handled. And we had a commissioner up in Mims who sort of handled things in that area. Each commissioner sort of took care of his own district back then. Do you remember the commissioner from your area? Who yes, his name was W.C. Ward Klingensmith. And he was commissioner for quite a while. Incidentally, we sold our grove up in the hammock to him. And it's still bearing fruit. Mm -hmm. And the other commissioner for a long time was Arthur Dunn from Mims. And then later after Klingensmith, we had a fellow named uh, Carpenter, Roy Carpenter, who was excellent at it too. Tell me, what were the elections like? Well, they were pretty exciting times here. And uh, there was always a lot of politicking. And uh, you would gather around the Star Advocate office at night because that's where the, the uh, votes came and the count came in. And so you'd maybe have 100, 200 people down there peering in the window. And, Bob Hudson and his father would post them on a great big card in the window and so forth. And uh, so you'd stay there at about midnight till you knew who had won or lost. But it was very interesting time, sure was. And it was also interesting when, they were, when the governor, the gentleman running for governorship would come through here. Uh, they would always make speeches downtown and attract big crowds and uh, make big promises and so forth. So it was quite exciting when you came to the political arena. Mostly Democrats, I guess. Yes, there was no Republicans in the territory. And, I'd, <laughs> and they, uh, it was not to quite a few years later that the Republicans began to make a show and now they're the dominant force pretty much. So it's interesting to see how these things do change. And because uh, nobody registered as a Republican then because you, hadn't, you couldn't vote in the primaries, you just couldn't participate because there was no primary, so you didn't have much of a voice. You could only vote in the final election. So consequently, everybody went as a Democrat. So the primaries were, were really the They were election. pretty much the election. Mm -hmm. They sure were. So that, they were pretty hard fought. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of political speeches in, in the various towns and so forth. And once a commissioner would get elected, 
How, were they? They usually stayed in for some time. Unfortunately, I guess we had good commissioners. Uh, they were easy to talk to. They knew, of course, they knew everybody. And we didn't have big problems back then like we do here in recent years. So they would usually serve for, for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. I know Mr. Arthur Dunn at Mims must have been in there 30, 40 years. And a gentleman named Mr. Fortenberry over on Merritt Island was in there for many years. But as I say, uh, they just didn't change much back then. Mm -hmm. Sure didn't. Well, you get to know your commissioner, know how to talk to him. Yes, you, were, you, you just knew him as a one-on-one -on -one basis, and you could get his ear without any trouble. And they were very well aware of what the situation was, because all of them had grown up here, been here for many years. And uh, I guess roads were a big thing, then, especially up in the groves, because you had to have uh, uh, gro roads and you had to have good drainage. So your commissioner had to be well attuned to, to the needs and had to supply those needs in order to stay in office. Mm -hmm. uh, that was prevalent in Titusville as well as the Mims area. Mm -hmm. Dr drainage made a big difference. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That started in the 20s or 30s, and I guess the, the stuff wasn't really... They weren't finished with that until the 50s sometime. That's right. Huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, we'll just go back a little bit and talk about the railroad. Okay. It was an important traveling. Yes, it was a real cog here. And if you wanted to go to Miami, anything place like that, or Jacksonville, you had to go on the rail. And this was before truck traffic was any, amounted to anything. We were probably one of the first truck agents here for a, a truck line and again we still had our transfer business this is when I'm still in school and uh, uh, we would uh, we had a warehouse and they would drop the, the merchandise off and we would deliver it but uh, the trucking was, was very small at that period of time so railroad was was a biggie and of course we had a lot of citrus that was shipped out of here and it was all went by rail at that time uh, and most of it went to the northern auction markets uh, and that was the predominant way of disposing or selling of your fruit was put it on auction in New York or Philadelphia or Baltimore. So uh, it sort of you took what they gave you in a way because you you couldn't do it otherwise you couldn't ship it back you had too much charges against it already. So but the, but the railroad was was a real key at that, that period of time in the early citrus days and in the fish industry too. And passenger service. And pardon? And passenger service. Passenger service, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess there was a, a, an accident. with. A we had a very bad train wreck at one time uh, back in the early uh, 30s there. Uh, we had a train southbound uh, FEC passenger derailed right above the overhead pass here and turned over. And of course all us school kids just sort of either let us out or we skipped hooky, but we went up there to see what was going on. It was right in the middle of the daytime. It was quite a, quite a bad wreck. Several people were killed and so forth. I guess the uh, train was just going too fast for the curve and uh, rolled over. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the circus came to town? Well, we had the circus come through here every once in a while. And evangelists, they were always interested uh, selling the snake medicine and so forth. And uh, they set up right downtown uh, in a vacant lot on Broad Street. and. Uh, a lot of people went to hear the evangelist and buy some of his wares and so forth. And we did have the circus and the carnivals like every other town. Would the uh, carnival and the circus come on the rails too? Yes, uh -huh. the, big, the big circus usually went to Orlando. But uh, we did have the small ones would come through here. Mm -hmm. But uh, Orlando drew the Ringland Brothers and so forth. And that's where a lot of people, of course, would go over there to watch those. We happened to be living in Orlando at one time when Ringland Brother came there, and my father took me down there to watch the elephants put the tents up and so forth. And they always had a big parade right down through to the main part of Orlando to all the wild animals and so forth in their carts. The tourist industry. The tourist industry was very quiet back then. We just didn't have anything to attract, in my opinion. Uh, we had a few uh, tourist courts, they called them back there. They were just individual uh, cabins, cottages. And uh, we had a few tourists, but not many. Uh, it, just, it was just was non-existent almost. Mm -hmm. uh, for some reason, they went on to Miami and the Palm Beach and the places like that. Uh, Cocoa Beach might have had a few, but I don't think they had a whole lot of them. 
Daytona was a big tourist area, always has been. Mm -hmm. And they promoted it and they did a good job at it. And they had facilities up there for them. So we kids, when we want, later on when we wanted to go to the beach, we'd go to New Smyrna or Daytona because that's where the action was. <laughs> and our beach had sort of played out by that time. Yeah, all you could do is go swimming. That's right. <laughs> Well, the, the big changes here all seem to come after World War II. What was your involvement? Well, I went into service in uh, October 1, 1941, just before Pearl Harbor, and uh, didn't get out to October, November of, of, of 45. Um, and of course, the, uh, during the war, they did a lot of good things here. The, one of the biggest and most important thing was they started to eradicate mosquitoes. And this was done to the, through the efforts of the Navy over at the Banana River Naval Air Station, which is on Cocoa Beach. And uh, they did, they really fought the mosquitoes and it started the beginning of the spray program. And that started to eliminate mosquitoes and that changed the whole environment here. People came out of the woodwork, you could go outdoors and enjoy life. I think that was the beginning maybe of the tourists coming into the area and uh, noting what we had here and the fine weather, but it was not after the war, um, World War II. Mm -hmm. And we didn't really grow much to the beginning of the missile industry. Um, I had moved to Vero Beach for a short period of time after we sold our grocery store and uh, I was looking for a new livelihood, so uh, I moved back here in 1957, and at that time we still only had about 3,500 people in Titusville, probably about 60,000 people in the whole county, and we got into the Burger King business, and the, this is when the construction worker just started to come in then. They would come in, they would be uh, uh, people with uh, young families, the engineer, first of course is construction people, uh, then came the engineers with the young families. And uh, it was just a godsend to our Burger King business because they were prime customers. They had the money, uh, they didn't want to cook all the time, and they had kids that uh, wanted to ha have burgers. So that's when we really began to grow in about 57, 58, or 59. Mm -hmm. And our population became to multiply, we couldn't keep up with roads, we couldn't keep up with the schools. That's when the portable school buildings became into wide use. So that's when we really began to take off. And it's just been a wonderful thing for this area, the quality of the people who came in here, the, the well-educated and the, uh, the engineers and that type of people has just been, just been wonderful for us, for our schools, for our hospitals, and all other things. Mm -hmm. Just added to our quality of life immensely. And of course, the mosquito problem is being eliminated all the time because the county got quite active in that after in the World War II. We had a mosquito control, control uh, set up, and they impounded areas they, uh, to keep the lava down. So it's, it's just been, it, that was the beginning of it in my estimation. I think you talk to Mr. Joe Wick if he'll agree with you. <laughs> yeah. He was a commissioner at that time. <laughs> But that changed the complexion of things. And, and uh, also, World War II brought some little airports in here, too. We had several airports. Uh, they developed one down what we call Tycho now, and that was a, a sort of a naval training place down there. And that helped. And of course, you had several of them in the vicinity uh, around Sanford and this place. But uh, the airplane uh, traffic became more prevalent. We had a small airport at the north part of Titusville called Arthur Dunn Airport, which had been in existence for quite a while, but didn't have much facilities there. Mm -hmm. But again, after the World War II, you had these people come in who could afford planes and took up flying and it became, and we had a flying school down at Tycho at one time. A good friend of ours, Charlie Robichard, who was a naval pilot, decided to develop a flying school. Uh, my first wife worked there. Uh, in this little school, and they did pretty good for about three or four years. But that was sort of the beginning of the, I would say, the uh, aviation in this area and the interest thereof. There might have been a few planes around when you were a kid, yeah? Just a few. One time we had a very bad accident out at uh, Arthur Dunn Airport, and that was when a 
three place or three air, uh, engine Stinson came into town. Um, and it happened to rain that night. And of course, the, the airport did not drain just exactly right. And as the plane attempted to take off, it did not get quite high enough. The wheels caught in the water and just flipped right over. Later on in my military life, I ran into one of the gentlemen that was on that plane. He remembered it very well. <laughs> Tysville Airport was prominent in his mind. Um, other things that changed around here, I mean, the space program took away the beach. Yes. Uh, this is when they decided to expand and condemn the land on the north end of the island up here when uh, my mother sold her land or they condemned it and so forth. Uh, we lost our beach. Um, later, one of our commissioners, Gene Roberts, who was uh, quite, a, quite a, a developer, he bought a good sized piece out at Fox Lake and developed that into a very fine park. Have a big pavilion out there, it's well equipped and it's used quite often for large functions. That's where we hold our Cracker Day once a year and we have two to three thousand people gather there last Sunday in October. A nice cool time of year. Yes, no mosquitoes. <laughs> Tell us about your, uh, your little development project there. Well, it's a long story. Uh, my parents had bought this piece of land right on US-1 on the river, in the, on the causeway at Titusville in about 1943-45. When I came home from the war at the end of 45, uh, I said to myself, this is where I'm going to make my fortune. So uh, I went down to Miami and bought an old dredge, which is a hydraulic dredge with a cutter head from, uh, on the west side of Miami where they dig the coral rock back there. Hired a trucking company to bring it up to Titusville. Hired a man who said he was a dredge man. <laughs> I took his word for it. Anyway, we started to dredge uh, the land where the Burger King is now. And uh, we were out in the river and we had bought some submerged land at this time and you had to buy your submerged land and get permission to pump. But about 48, uh, we got the dredge going, and I'm pumping in where the Burger King is now. And after about a year, I decided I could do better with a wheelbarrow and a shovel than I could with that dredge. So I, <laughs> I shut the dredge down, and a few years later, when we got ready to build the Burger King, I had not filled in the land enough to, to build it. I got a firm from Jacksonville to come down. And they set up out in the river, and they did pretty good. We pumped in about uh, a city block. Uh, where the Burger King was, uh, right on US-1, was about uh, six or seven feet below the level of the road. And it was one of the finest uh, muck gardens around here. So we had to fill that whole uh, garden up and the uh, land along the causeway because when the dredge got through pumping the causeway, which was done in 1942, uh, you, you right from the crown of the road while you sloped right off into the marsh. So you had very little shoulder to work with. So they just left you with a big marsh there and so forth. And uh, they consequently they dug a deep ditch all the way across the river, about 200 feet wide and about 1,800, about 18 feet deep. And uh, this shows up on your coast and geodetic maps now. So I came along, keep struggling with this piece of property and uh, each year I'd be able to buy a little bit more from the, from the trustees' internal improvement fund till we'd made five purchases of this submerged land. Well, where we left off, you had purchased some additional bottom land from the internal improvement fund, and you were going to do some more dredging? Yes. Uh, we would uh, we'd, we'd eventually buy another piece of land due to circumstances. As I say, this one lady uh, who was in the next block was always object what we wanted to do. And McCarter, Mr. Mack, who has the Ford garage, and Eddie Nelson, who had another piece of land, we always went together and made our with separate applications. But we always went up and fought the battles together. And this one party uh, who had a son who uh, went to school just long enough to find out how to f file a lawsuit uh, was always come along, and first thing we know, we had a lawsuit to go back and fight against. But this went on for about uh, eight or ten years. And uh, then uh, 
Mac McCarter and Eddie Nelson tried to buy the land from this lady who was right in the, right in the between us. And uh, she just wouldn't do anything and she wouldn't develop her land or anything. But unfortunately, uh, she, she got killed on the highway uh, right in front of the Burger King and, uh, and, and <laughs> it's just unfortunate. But uh, this was the end of, of the, really the problems. But uh, we continued to go on and I made five different land purchases of submerged land. And we finally wound up by compromising and doing this, we wound up with about a thousand feet of waterfront and uh, 16 acres of, of land. Well, I started filling these in about uh, 10 years ago and this, the, uh, I was all ready to do it when Governor Askew did 180 degrees up in Tallahassee. He said there'd be no more filling, no more dredging, this, that, and the other, unless your dredges actually work in filling, and of course ours wasn't. So it took us another about six or seven years before we could get a permit to fill and then we had to truck in the dirt. We could not dredge it, which makes it very expensive and uh, doesn't get you near as good compaction and so forth. Anyway, I found a very reputable black person in Mims who had some nice trucks and a great big uh, place to dig dirt. So we hauled dirt for about four or five years, uh, filling up this deep hole It's now uh, 18 feet deep and you got to come three or four feet above it's almost 21 vertical feet of fill so we worked here for two or three years we had another problem develop this had been a collection basin for 40 some years of silt being all the southeast wind brought all the silt in and deposited on our land as we pushed the new dirt in and pushed the silt out of the way it became so thick the silt did we could not push any more dirt into the river. So we then had to get a dredging permit from the Corps of Engineers to remove the top 10 feet of the silt. So that relieved the, the situation so we could continue filling. So anyway, to make a long story short, we now have a, uh, a marina out there with 40 slips in a very modern uh, concrete floating docks. Uh, on about seven acres of submerged land. We have 10 acres of upland already to fill, already to build on with nice coquina rock wall. We built a 50 by 50 uh, two-story office building, which we have the top floor rented, but unfortunately not the bottom floor. So we're looking for uh, developers with nerve and money. Uh, so far, we've only found them with nerve. Uh, they just got an idea. and. It, our delicate age, we said, gee, we can't become involved in long range, long mortgage uh, situations. So we're still striving to find a good, conscientious, quality minded developer who's got some money. Mm -hmm. So if you know everybody, you can pass the word along. <laughs> but I worked on this for about 50 years now, and uh, here I'm getting the end of the line, and uh, I need to move in a hurry. <laughs> I have two sisters younger than I, and of course they have five. Uh, sons who can probably carry on and, and develop in something nice. Mm -hmm. We do have some, we have had some quality developers come in, but for some reason they just couldn't sell themselves on Titusville. They had the money, they had, they've done it before, but unfortunately, and the city just cooperates uh, mm -hmm. wonderfully, but uh, they, they just sort of drift away after a while. But someday we hope somebody will come along to conclude my 50 years of work. <laughs> That's about all I can tell you about that one. <laughs> Getting back to the land development idea, I have one other interesting thing I'd like to comment on. When we got our application to put in the docks, we were permitted to do the whole marina. But we got the bid, and the bid came in pretty high, about a million dollars. And we said to ourselves, gee, I don't know if we want to gamble a million dollars on a marina and the city at that time was expanding there, more than doubling it. So we said, why don't we get our big foot well in the door and build a big first half of the marina, which is what we did. So we built 40 slips thinking we could come back in just a couple of years without any trouble and get another permit. So we put in a permit in 90, March of 90, and it went through all the circles and so forth and we thought we were in pretty good position and all of a sudden the manatee thing pops up. So they say in just a few words, we will not talk to you anymore until the county adopts a manatee protection plan. 
Well, they've been working on this now about two years, and my guess is it'll be another year to year and a half before this manatee plan is adopted. And right now it's very restrictive. No one could build a marina now. Uh, I think they allow one slip for every 100 feet. So you'd have to have a pretty good uh, frontage in order to put a marina in. It's most unfair. But anyway, that's the predicament we're in right this moment. Uh, we sit there waiting. Our, our marina is too small to uh, make a profit. The county has seen fit to put a $30,000 tax bill on us uh, here this last year. Uh, there's no way we can make it. We just have to sit there and suffer. But I'm hoping things will turn around, that uh, uh, the manatee th eventually will be adopted, the plan, and we can get our permit to continue on. But we are certainly caught in the middle right now, and I can sympathize with some of our other pioneers in this area who <laughs> have gone a little too extremes in this situ type of situation. That's about the end of my development thing right now. All I do is sit there and pay taxes and cut the weeds right now. Thank goodness there's no mosquitoes to kill, though. <laughs> Yeah, don't have to put uh, kerosene on everything. Right. <laughs> well, things kind of boom and bust out at the at the space center too. Yes, uh, unfortunately, I invested in some real estate, uh, thinking that Clinton, when he got in there, would really turn the thing around. And uh, I invested in another piece of waterfront, and I've got involved in a tennis uh, facility with about uh, some building lots. And uh, real estate is just at a, a very slow pace right now. You just can't hardly give it away. And uh, I hope our tax man uh, takes heed of this. I think they're doing a great disservice to the, to the whole county. This, to my opinion, they're slowing down growth. We just, the businesses just cannot afford this type of overhead, cannot make it. And I hope, I see it's prevalent now somewhat this thinking in our city council. We, have a new city council uh, of three members. We have a new city manager coming on board. And again, uh, here recently they turned down a very nice grant from the state where they were, had big plans to do the waterfront development. And uh, lo and behold, one night the uh, three councilmen who were against it fired the city manager and they were the ones that were up for re-election. They had voted, uh, they had already announced they were not gonna rerun. So we're sort of been in a, a holding pattern here for about eight or nine months now, and I hope something productive is forthcoming soon. Yeah. We'll all be gone. We'll be worse than the Depression days. Well, it, it has happened here because the space program boomed, and then starting in 70 to 80, it was very poor kind of situation. When Johnson moved it, everything to Houston, the motels on Cocoa Beach really suffered because they had big mortgages and they were predicated on probably leasing those rooms for two to three years to the space companies and they just pulled out. It just left us holding the bag. Mm -hmm. Our property values here dropped way down. Many people came up from Miami and, and invested here and got good buys. It was really the start of the um, sort of senior citizens yes, retirement mm -hmm. thing because all of a sudden wonderful properties were for sale for, right. for the mortgage. That's right. Just pick them up for what to do. That's right. But uh, right now we're, st we're in a very low ebb of real estate. Mm -hmm. And I hope something is forthcoming soon, especially in the space program, to get some direction from Congress as well as from NASA as what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Right now we don't have it. We're talking about they might move the stuff from Houston back here. It may, uh, we, it may uh, turn around and come back. Could. Uh, Congress is getting on them quite uh, yeah. severely for cleaning their house and getting their cutting back, curtailing their expenditures. So maybe it will yeah. be productive in the long run. We that, could use it. That would be good. Before 1960s, all of the black families all lived in one part of town here in Titusville, the whites in the other. Was, how did that work? Well, fortunately, we've never had a problem here with integration. Uh, it's amusing, when I was a young boy of about 10, 11, or 12, we played with the black children. Some of our best friends were a family up at Regrange, and we used to play baseball together, and it was a large family. And uh, they're still around here, the Wilson family, and they have just been outstanding. But uh, we just never had an integration problem here, and I, I haven't heard of any. There was a little bit of tense uh, time there at one time, but it was a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. 
But I see now the blacks living in many uh, neighborhoods where the whites and blacks are co-mingling. So we've just fortunately never had a real problem here. Uh, the schools are much better and uh, so forth. At one time, I do think they were disadvantaged, no question about it. Uh, but it's greatly improved and they, they've, they've just been real good neighbors. Uh, this always remains somewhat separated. Uh, up in Mims, it's the same way. And of course, the uh, uh, great number of these black people worked in the citrus, but that is waning now somewhat, and a lot of them were able to go over to the Cape and get good jobs. But they were heavy in the citrus and in the farming and so forth. Not much in the fishing, but in the citrus. So I'm very grateful that we just had no real problem here. I think we were way ahead of the rest of the nation. We just had some excellent black people who had been here for many years, and uh, I still have many of them as our friends. Yeah. Matter of fact, I guess big part of our grocery business, I spoke was credit, and we raised quite a few black families here on credit. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were very good pay. Uh, we had quite a few section hands on the railroad that would come in twice a month. And that was always an innocent time because they, they just got paid twice a month. And, they lived up uh, above, uh, out at Maytown, a few miles away, and uh, the groceries were so cheap then that uh, probably $10, you could fill a great big croaker sack with food that all two, two of us could carry it. We'd load up the old car and take them down to the railroad station and put them on their little hand cars and send them off on their way. So we've just had, a, in our, certainly in our family, had a good relationship with blacks. And we're grateful for it. It seems that that's often the case when you have small enough towns where people know every, they know, everybody knows everybody else. Knew everybody. Uh, my father was very generous. Uh, he gave the, to the churches, anybody wanted to build church, he would give money. And uh, we just cultivated that type of relationship and that's why it was. We just, we knew each other mm -hmm. and we respected them and uh, they were good workers, and good pay, no problems. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, you were going to tell us a little bit about the citrus. Yes, uh, shortly after the war, I got ill and had to find a sitting down job. So therefore, we sold the grocery store business. And I was able to get a job as executive secretary of a citrus trade association in Vero Beach. Uh, this is in 1948. So my wife and I moved to Vero Beach. and. Uh, there was about 1,200 growers in the association and all the prominent shippers. And uh, the saying was, well, you'll never get all these shippers together because uh, they're sort of very competitive and they are very uh, jealous of their accounts, their growers, and so forth. So anyway, we kept working away and working away, and it turned out that the citrus reed became very prominent, and it's still very prominent today. Uh, Vero Beach is pretty much the center of the citrus and uh, it wasn't so much so then because we had quite a few groves still up in the north end of, of uh, Brevard County and a little bit in South Volusia. But uh, you could see the, the growth going so uh, southward all the time, uh, cold became a problem and uh, the, the most of the packing houses were down in the Vero Beach, Fort Pierce area. Uh, so the new groves, and it seems like the, the northern people with the money, and they were industrial steel people and so forth, came down with big uh, sums of capital and invested in, the, in that area because it was warmer. They had a uh, water control structure uh, for their dikes and so forth so they could control their flooding areas. Uh, they were just much better prepared. They also had wider east-west areas to develop in. And what would happen, the, uh, the tomato man would come in first and he'd put in one or two crops of tomatoes, that would clear the land and fertilize it, and then you can't replant tomatoes too often, so then they would go to citrus. So it was just sort of a natural, you would use it first as tomatoes, and then you, since it was all cleared and ready to go, you'd plant citrus. And it was warmer. Uh, it does have probably a little more of a hurricane risk. Uh, we had a bad hurricane in 50, and we had to, uh, bring the people down from Washington, fly them all over the Okeechobee area, it flooded even down into Miami. It flooded up into St. Lucie and Vero Beach. Uh, I've, I've seen the water two and three feet up on the trunk of the trees for two weeks at a time. So uh, 
anyway, it was very, it's been, it was a very interesting time of, of my business life, and I was there for eight years in this, in this job. And uh, however, now, three, f a few years ago, we had several bad freezes, and that really began to tell the story. And again, the big money now is even going farther south, down south of Okeechobee now. So it's too bad we're losing out up on the citrus, but I do think maybe the retirees coming in, our tourist uh, availability is picking up some now. So we're getting an offset, but it's probably hard on the, the black folks who are heavy uh, workers in the industry, and they've had to find other, other means of livelihood. But it is certainly a changing industry, and uh, it's still, I guess, a fairly good investment, but, but the big, big companies got into it, and that, uh, the, the small grower was just out of, put out of business. But uh, that was just an interesting time of my life. It was about that time, I guess, that, that the Indian River fruit got a reputation separate from other fruit. Well, we we'd, uh, had established that way back in the 30s. Uh, and that was done just before I went with the league. They had gotten the Federal Trade Commission down here and, and had many hearings. And the Federal Trade Commission ruled that this was a distinct and unique growing area. And therefore, only the fruit grown in this area could use the label Indian River. Now that's being infringed upon a little bit because where does the river stop <laughs> and end and as these new plantings are going southward? But that was all accomplished back in the 1930s, 35. And it really has helped the river to get a premium price for their citrus. But that was done just before I went with the Citrus League, but they still have to fight to protect that, uh, that label, that brand name. Mm -hmm. Okay.